My guest today is Ashton Clark. Ashton, how are you, sir? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing really well. I, I had uh, the pleasure of seeing you speak at the BDPA a few weeks ago, and you were talking, you and your brother actually were talking about uh, your current business and some of your past business and your sure. evolution along the way. I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit about that, yeah, because you're, you're, you've had a couple of successful business. The most recent one is Ticket Falcon. Yeah, yeah. So my brother Ryan, who hopefully he'll be able to join, you know how it goes sometimes when you get those those fire drills <laughs> that you have. You got to that day engage. job gets in the way. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so he'll he'll try to hop on if he can. But yeah, I'm Ashton, and my identical twin brother, his name is Ryan. We are the co-founders of Ticket Falcon, and when we were speaking at BDPA, we mentioned the Ticket Falcon is an online event registration and management platform for general admission and reserve seating events with direct payouts. And my brother and I built that because we really we're frustrated with some of the existing ticketing platforms out there. They oh, were just you and everybody else. Exactly. They were expensive. Those fees can be overbearing for a, a lot of individuals and just taxing overall. And, and we say, you know, we, we're technologists and also businessmen. And so why don't we just build our, our own tool? And, and that's really how Ticket Falcon took flight. So during the meeting, we talked about a lot of things, right? Uh, you know, we've been growing quickly, which is a, a blessing. But also as you grow, you have to think about, you know, how do you maintain the integrity of your application and your mm. systems and platforms to make sure that you have reliability and availability and that, you know, you minimize any cases of downtime. That's one of the biggest things of any site. You think about all the major players, all the big box companies, if mm -hmm. their website is not available for even a, a couple of seconds, right, it can have a catastrophic impact on, oh, on yeah. their revenue. And so for us, we like to look at it the same way that we want to do everything that we can to ensure the uptime of our platform. But in some instances, this is being candid, there are some things that are just out of our control, right? You think about like the backbone of the internet, <laughs> if sure. that goes out, right? It, our site itself, right? Our platform, our servers may have been just fine, but the connection points to it could have had some disruption. So part of what we want to do is figure out how do we mitigate any instances that would prevent users from taking advantage of what we have to offer. And so, you know, I see Ryan's on and that's that's great. Hey, good, good to see you. We just hey, kicked off this session, but I was talking about, you know, with our site and, and making sure that Ticket Falcon has high availability is that you can do everything right, but there are some things that are just out of your control as you think about the connection points to the servers that maintain mm -hmm. our website. And so for us, we're always looking for opportunities to one, make our site faster, right? Think about all the security aspects that go along with that and really high availability. We want people to be able to use our website throughout all times of the day and night. And then and in, in, in this last point I mentioned is that you do have planned downtime. I mean, I would think most websites just period you have to have downtime whether you're scaling up a server whether you need to restart your server for whatever it is right and we try to do that early in the morning but during the core business hours our intent is to make sure that we're fully operational and if something does happen that's out of our control we try to make sure that we let those who are using our platform know so that you know there's nothing out of the ordinary that occurs and, and that's one of the things that i know we didn't speak about in detail at bdpa a couple of weeks ago but something i thought would be important because many entrepreneurs that have technology platforms and and websites like ourselves have to think about this and if they're not thinking about it you know you don't want to think about it when something bad happens right you want to have plans yeah, in place to be preventative and then if something doesn't go as planned that you have a, a plan that you can follow to make sure that everybody is understanding what's going on and that you can work throughout the situation to make it a success at the end of the day awesome well i want to introduce our viewers to ryan clark your your brother <laughs> who just joined us and uh and, and let's talk a little about it. i think the, uh, you mentioned the the speed and the high availability and the security and those are all is there is there a, a priority when you talk about those which one you need to focus on first yeah, and I'll take this and I'll pass it over to Ryan. I mean, at the end of the day, it's it's an interesting question because in my head, I'm like, they're all important, <laughs> right? Yeah. But if I had to rank one, right? I mean, well, let's let's talk about it like this, right? We, our site could be available, but ridiculously slow. That's going to make people upset just as if our site was not available, right? right? And so we have to find a fine balance between availability and uptime and the speed of our website so that people can utilize it. And really what it comes down to is server processing. As our site grows and more people use it, that requires more server resources. And I think that's something that, I mean, I know people talk about, but you know, how do you 
uh, and I'm, I was going to make up a word, but take the, and I know this is technology and friends. So we're amongst friends who understand technology, <laughs> right? You see, I, I threw that in there, but, but at the same time, <laughs> I want to make it more business centric, right? And not get into sure. all the, the technical components of it, but uh, at the end of the day, totally. right? Technology is only as good if it solves a problem and business right. is a problem. Right, right, right. And so from a business perspective, for us, it's more so you have to strike a fine balance between that availability and uptime and ensuring that people can use our site. But what it comes down to is server. So what people oftentimes talk about on a more technical sense is, well, you know, if I add this capacity, here are the technical things that come in place. And to make it very simple, right? There are some complexities when it comes to, to servers, right? And sometimes when you add capacity, you may have to restart your server. This notion of the cloud right is 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 confusing <laughs> yeah I, I don't know why i just did that when i did this but uh, that's <laughs> something you learn I, that happened to me on teams once in a meeting and a whole bunch of balloons popped up i still it don't understand that <laughs> it's something that you do for with hands. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 from a business sense it's like you have to know that so i'll give an example let's say something happened you really need to increase your capacity because you have an a bit a big event going on for us we have to plan that out and be strategic about it right we can't wait right. until like 10 minutes before the event because i mean could we do it sure but it's like you're rushing to do something that you knew was going to happen in the first place so from a business perspective we have to make sure that we plan this out in such a way that it doesn't impact our revenue and that it makes our customers happy and lastly i'll say our customers always appreciate transparency if something if there's something that we need to do to improve our in you know, our platform to make sure that we have the scalability that's required they much appreciate the fact that, oh, they told us in advance they're not going to be available for a few minutes because they have to do X, Y, and Z. And, you know, they they wait that time out and then they come back to our platform when it's available. And that, that happens every now and again. Uh, awesome. And you mentioned a, a, a good point here, which is uh, availability and speed are important. But there are times mm -hmm. when it's really, really, really important. Like right. your uh, tickets, your, your job is to sell tickets. And when, you know, Beyonce tickets go on sale at 10 a.m. on Tuesday... That site better be available at 10 a.m. on Tuesday. If it's down right. at midnight and there's nothing, you know, people are gonna all her, her all of her minions are gonna rush to the site at 10:01. Exactly. exactly. Melt right. the servers potentially. Yeah, I'd like to also right. say I think they were in the business of preventing bad user experiences. Yeah. Right. If you have if the user has a bad experience, may they come back to the site? Possibly if it's something that they need to go to to access and get what they need. But a lot sure. of times, if somebody has a bad user experience, they may try to find an alternative. You know, right. so I'd like to say that we s help people buy tickets and sell tickets, of course, to events, but we also try to prevent as many bad user experiences as we can throughout the process. Awesome. Oh, well, let's talk about security because I think, uh, Ashton, you mentioned this earlier. You need to be proactive about these things, and too many people, too many organizations are not proactive. They wait until the disaster sure. strikes before they even think about security. Right. Yeah. I mean, and that's another point, too, that we always have to maintain the integrity of our data. And as you grow, I and I dislike saying this, but the reality of it is as you get bigger, you become more of a target for, as I would call, bad actors. And this could be a kid somewhere that's just learning how to do something similar across your website. They find a vulnerability and they exploit it. Or it could be somebody who's trying to do it to exploit you for for money. Right. You think about ransomware and things like that. And so for us, it's more so how do we know what's going on in the world and then protect our environment so that our site can operate effectively. And so from a security perspective, it's it goes down to the base level of server patching. Right. How do you make sure that you minimize any back doors to your server? How do you make sure that you can, even if something were to happen, that you can identify it and then stop it by using machine learning and AI and all that great stuff? And so we have certain tools in place at a very enterprise level that allows us to minimize, if not mitigate, certain things that happen before they become more widespread. And a perfect example of that is a denial of service. And a denial, or also known as a DDoS attack, is when, in, in the way I look at it, and this is in business sense, is that you have a computer, you have a whole bunch of windows open, and then somehow you hit a window and it just keeps opening, op opening and opening and opening and opening, and then your computer gets really slow. And then you either, if you're a Windows machine, you get the blue screen of, of death, as they so call it, or if it's a Mac, it just stops working, right? Because you ran out of of RAM, right, of, of, of the ability to be able to process things that you need for your computer. That's the same thing that happens with the DDoS attack, where you have individuals that are pinging our servers often, trying to leverage as much of our server resources as possible until they bring down the server or the website yeah. in this instance. And that, you know, we've seen that happen, or, or I should say, happen in the sense that we've seen people try to do that, where they you get all these different servers from all across the world pinging your environment, and now you need to be able to deflect it, right? And send it right back at them, like, no, you're not going to do that to us, right? And we have other ways that DDoS 
attacks can happen too. It can happen through some of our partners, right? Where someone is able to manipulate a service and then, you know, they can send requests over and over again and then they tie up sort of resource. So we've had to proactively think from a security perspective as well as from a performance perspective, what do we put in place so that we can minimize these things from happening? And, you know, I hate to say some of these things you may not be able to fully prevent. You know, something could happen with the technology that you don't necessarily own, but you may leverage in a way. And right. they could have a bug or something that someone is able to exploit that now negatively impacts your site. And I'll be candid again. We saw something like this happen a couple of weeks ago that was out of our control and that millions of websites actually experienced the same thing. You know, we experienced oh. some challenges for a few minutes and it wasn't our fault. It was more so something that we have to leverage because most of these server environments use enterprise grade technologies and platforms. And if one of them experienced an issue, so will you. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, payment processing is probably one that I, I can't imagine you all do your own payment processing. You have some bank that takes Not care yet. of that. And, and there are, well, I don't know if it's practical to everybody have their own payment because their services will do it much more efficiently and cheaper. Sure. So, uh, but, but now you're relying on something out of your control. Right. Exactly. That's a, that's a very good point. And not to say that we couldn't, right? We could stand up our own payment processing system. And I mean, many event organizing or event platforms that allow organizers to sell tickets to do that because it allows them to generate more revenue. But with right. that comes more risk. And so we have to think about, you know, is the risk worth us delving into that type of environment, such as payment processing? Or to your point, do we leverage a strong partner who can work with us to expedite what we're looking to do with the security protocols in place to make sure that not only are we protected, but also our event organizers and attendees? Awesome. Hey, Ryan, you want to add something to that? I mean, I think at the end of the day, I, like I mentioned before, right, just making sure that our stuff works when it's supposed to work is the biggest yes. thing I'd like to mention. So speed, security is another thing. I mean, he's right. We've got enterprise level solutions to help us offset that. But we're constantly monitoring as well. Um, you got to imagine, like, I see this even in my world on the Microsoft side, people trying to take advantage of, you know, people's logged in sessions by like phishing emails. And then a company mm -hmm. gets hacked. And then, you know, all kind of crazy stuff happens. That can happen on a website too. You click the wrong email, you think you're logging into something that is something that you used to log in into, and then you end up giving somebody your access, like your password and login information. They can then hijack a cookie session on your computer. Just blows my mind, by the way, how that stuff happens. Yeah. Um, but that's the type of stuff we have to think about. And it's just like, that's what keeps me up at night. But we're very good so far, like kind of how we've been handling it. And I want to keep it that way. I want to keep our system safe and I want to keep our users happy as, and safe as well. That's awesome. Yeah, I, 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 even just hijacking cookies, somebody has to be a technologist to do that. But I was, I was hacked one time. Somebody bought some food with my Grubhub account, mm -hmm. and the mistake I made is I had the same password mm -hmm. on multiple accounts. Somebody, a, a account that I hadn't used in years, got hacked. Suddenly, they had my email and password that I was using. So they just randomly tried a bunch of things. Oh, Grubhub, he's using there. Next thing, I have two hundred dollar order in Philadelphia oh, wow. for food delivery. Yeah. Uh, so sometimes it's a low tech thing like that. That's just uh, right. Me as a user, just being foolish. Yeah, Strong it happens to everybody. Is key. I mean, it happens to everybody. And I tell folks that you know, as you get and you have different individuals that are at different levels of their technology use, right? You have early adopters, and then you have those that they would call laggards. You know that that maturity curve for long sure. technology adoption. But the point is that today, right, you have password management platforms. Apple has one, Google has one, LastPass is one. Ryan introduced another one that I can't remember the name. But you can, you know, secure your passwords in you know a more technical way. But even some of those platforms are able to be hacked in some ways, right? If certain information is out there or servers are addressed. So you kind of have to use those with, you know, understanding what they come with and what they do and kind of how they, one, if they did get hacked in some way, how do they notify you? And if they are hacked, what are they people hacking? Are they hash, you know, hacking hashed passwords or can they see your real, I mean, you have to think about that, but you know, those password managers are great because one of the things that outside of just storing your password, you can click a button and have them generate a password for you. So that minimizes and mitigates the chance of you having duplicative passwords across all the systems and, and websites that you use. I have since learned my lesson. I am using a password manager now. <laughs> but even and, that, I have to go back and change all my old passwords. That's the, yeah. that's the Or idea. it could be somebody you know. Right. That, and, you know, let's say you irritated somebody. They know you use the same password. It's one, two, through A, B, C, apostrophe or whatever. That, right. Ex-girlfriend <laughs> problem. <laughs> I'm just I'm not saying that happened to any one of us, but <laughs> there's somebody out there that it did and where they know what the password is. And like, well, you know what? Grubhub sounds good. And bam. <laughs> 
Hey, uh, tell me a little bit about your your journey here to, to being a successful entrepreneur in this ticket business. I know you didn't start with a tickets business. You you started uh, in high school, I think, right? Yeah, we uh, were 16 years old um, selling sneakers um, to kids our age. I don't know how they were buying these sneakers off of our feet, but they were buying. <laughs> They were stealing my my credit card and password. <laughs> right, to get, to get the money and the funds to be able to do it. Um, but I'd like to compare that to like when, when we were in school, you know, there would be kids that would actually be selling like candy. They would take right. bulk candy, package them up, and they may sell them for 50 cents or a dollar, right? So I compare that to us having a single pair of shoes that we're selling for $100, $150. And we can't even wear the shoes for longer than two hours without somebody wanting to buy it. Here's the cash. Wherever they got the cash, <laughs> Not my problem, but those transactions were taking place. And so, um, and even prior to that, part of the reason why we got into the business world is because our parents always said, you're gonna learn and understand the value of a dollar, but you're gonna first understand how to earn it and make that dollar yourself. And so we had some odd jobs that we kind of figured out how to scale. But when we had, I think we were, might've been like nine or 10 years old at the time, we were just raking leaves and shoveling snow in our area. And we found out that we can cover more land and have more ability to generate more revenue if we had other people in our area, other kids our age, working other blocks, right? We would just take a percentage of the sale that was generated. And so that's when I said, well, we don't have to do all the work ourselves. Let's figure out how to get more access and spread the wealth in the community, making sure that our friends get money, we get money, but we're also providing a great service. On the flip side, now what I see is with websites that, you know, thousands, if not millions of people are accessing, you know, you have greater scale, but you don't necessarily have to have, you know, boots on the ground all the time. Okay. Right. Like Ashton and I can, you know, even with our ticketing business, we don't need a thousand people to run that website, but thousands of people could be buying a ticket at a time. You get what I'm saying? So the way that we've, I guess, transcended what our initial thoughts might have been with regards to, oh, we just need staff doing this, this, this and this benefit of a website is if you have the great the perfect technology not perfect but the best technology you can find you've got the best resources you can have you can have a lot of people buying stuff from you on your website without the need to have a huge number of staff that's my point yeah i think that's one of the big things that cloud computing has done is it has democratized a lot of these opportunities you know Absolutely. a website that sells things is one thing uh services that can provide scalability is another uh, access to large amounts of compute power. It, it, 30 years ago, you would have to probably either buy a computer, you know, a, a, a server-sized computer, mm -hmm. or rent space on it, or, or work for a big company that did that. It was really inaccessible. There's, there's no way a high schooler in his mom's basement would be able to do that. That's right. just not practical. Right, yeah. It was out of, out of the control of a lot of people because they couldn't afford it. Right. I mean, back then you think about back in 20 or 2005, 2006, just how expensive it was to do something like that. And to your point, you can go in the cloud and the cloud can be very complex. And I keep saying this because it sounds very simple. When you start looking at some of these packages and what it comes with and what this does versus that. Right. It, it, it can be very complicated in terms of what these packages offer. But once you understand that language yeah. and I call it cloud computing language and what it means to have compute power and RAM and all this great stuff, right? It's just like, wow, to your point, we can spin up a server extremely quickly to meet some of the needs of certain things that we experience. And we're on the side where we don't wanna unnecessarily pay for compute speed that we're not going to use because we're very conscious of our environment, right? You're paying for something that, you know, if you're not using it, it contributes to, you know, energy that's used to bring those servers online, right? I mean, it, it takes electricity, that electricity comes from somewhere. And so we have to be cognizant of that. And so we only try to use the compute power where it makes sense for specific right. things that we have going on throughout the duration of the events that we have. But it's not like we spend a whole, and I'll be candid, it's not like we spend a boatload of money on servers just because. That doesn't make sure. financial sense, right? Especially in the way that I'm saying this because many of you on, on that are listening in probably know this, but, you can ebb and flow. And I think once we really started to understand that, it changed things for us because now we've been able to run our platform in a way that makes sense and that we're conscious about our environment and that we're spending money on things that make sense without wasting it. Totally makes sense. I, I know one of you, I can't remember which one, is a Microsoft MVP. That would be me. You are. Tell me, is that is that impacted the way you approach this business at all? Um, absolutely. I, I mean... And in, in regards to just community, right? Because, you know, I've always heard, you know, if you um, love a job or love the work that you do, it doesn't feel like work, right? You may be something that you're passionate about. 
And so because on the Microsoft MVP side with my consulting firm that I have on the Microsoft side of things, I love the work that I do. It doesn't feel like work. So I treat Ticket Falcon in that same vein. I love to see the fact that people can post an event on our site and then they've got people that are buying or you know collecting tickets on there. And we are actually facilitating that transaction and people are happy and enjoying the process. I mean, I just, it just, it makes me want to continue to build a great pro product and a service that even more people will use because I know that it's meaningful and it's a reason why we have repeat customers the way that we do. Awesome. We keep saying that site. What's the URL of your site? Uh, which one? Ticketfalcon.com? Yeah. Ticketfalcon.com. Right. There you go. Awesome. <laughs> uh, is there anything we haven't talked about that we should? Oh, there's one other thing that I, I wanted to bring yeah. up. I don't know if this was brought up before, but when we talked about, you know, um, we had had a website, you know, back in 2006 and, you know, we're selling sneakers. I, I said we started off doing it in school. Ultimately, we built a very large website that was selling many shoes per day. Right. Um, at that time, I would say it may have been less known for young people like ourselves at that time how to build a website. So we'd be in the library trying to study all of that stuff and learn PHP, ASP, all those different you know languages. Um, but one thing that I do recall is that there was less competition online at that time as there is today. Right. Think about how many dot com names are taken up or whatever your top level domain or TLD that you may want. Somebody probably already has it. And so what I've learned is, is that you've got to be more creative nowadays. I feel like then we had to be, you know, back 20 years ago, almost. I could buy a dot com name that I can think of in 10 minutes. Now it may take me two days because it's the one you want is taken. You have to. Exactly. Uh, I, I, you have to remove the vowels. That's what I say. You disavowal <laughs> right. the, the English language words. <laughs> right. oh, how did you come up with the name Ticket Falcon? Now, it's a great question. So my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, you know, sat down. She heard the original name. And since this is being recorded, uh, who cares? I'll tell you. So I I'm still was excited about this name. So I was in my head. I was like, I got this name. I'm coming up with all this great stuff. And so the name that I wanted was called Tix Boss, T-I-X-B-O-S-S dot -S com, because you could be okay. the boss of your tickets. I thought it was the greatest <laughs> slogan, tagline, domain, ticksboss.com, owned it, .net, owned it. I mean, bought all the different extensions of the, you know, the TLDs that Ryan was, was mentioning earlier. And then I started mentioning to him, of course, and my girlfriend, now wife at the time, and my mother and the rest of the family members, they were like, they didn't, they didn't love it like you do. <laughs> they were like, say it, say it 10 times fast. And I couldn't do that. Uh. <laughs> And so they're like, if you can't do that, then no, you bought it, you spend, I don't know what I paid, maybe $15 because the domain name was available. Clearly no one else thought it was as great of an idea as in a domain name as I did, but they're like, no, forget it. So we were in Houston for something, our, our grandfather, maybe it was his birthday or something. And I remember we were in a hotel room and my, my girlfriend, now wife, get a sheet of paper and we're going to start coming up with ideas. And so Tix Boss was up there, but there was an X put through it you know, because it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't what she wanted. But, but she used it as motivation, right? Like you got to see what you had and how it could be better and you're not going to use it again. So we need to move away from it. So I always was looking at a sheet of paper and saw that up there and I was just mad, but that motivated me to come up with another name. With that said, we started coming up with all these words like, okay, tickets, events, and other things that could be in combination with that. And you know, my wife's maiden name is Eagles. And so I was being funny because I was like, you know, you got rid of my name, Ticks Boss. I'm going to throw yours in here. So I was like, well, what about TicketEagles.com? <laughs> she was like, it doesn't really ring like, like I think it should. And then kudos to her. She was like, well, what about a falcon? Well, it's another bird like, of well, prey. <laughs> it is. And the falcon, Pelican Falcon is the fastest animal on the planet right i did not when know you start getting down to it yes when you start it's a very fast animal and so i say all that to say is that she was like ticket falcon she put it on the paper right we didn't put any x's we underlined a little bit i was like well let me see if this is available right and somehow it was awesome. right it, it was available we, we paid the money for it right and we got the domain name and so now i have to give her her flowers in the sense that you know you helped me come up with this name i still own ticks boss i'm gonna probably <laughs> always own it unless somebody gives us an offer that we cannot refuse but but ticket falcon has been something that's resonated with folks because it's unique even if you look at our logo right the fact that we've been able to tie a ticket into the, the falcon if you think about how that that works with our logo and i don't know maybe you'll you'll pull it up on screen I think you were mentioning that you use very expensive tools to do your videography. Maybe you'll have I it float in. very inexpensive tools to do my videography. <laughs> <laughs> you may pull it in and out, but the Ticket Falcon logo is unique in that sense. And and I say all that to say, 
say is that we went from the hotel room, we slashed my idea called Ticks Boss, then came up with the name Ticket Falcon, and now we have the trademark and we've been running it ever since. And it just talks about how important it is that you have community, right? I think businesses yeah. should not always be built in a vacuum, right? If we if we went on with Ticks Boss and they didn't like it, right? You can imagine all the other people's like, I don't, I don't like the name. Why would I want to use that? People like the name Falcon because we can have fun with it. You know, if you heard me say earlier, I was like, well, that's how Ticket Falcon took flight. I have a blast with all these different things, right? And so, or, or you know, this is how we were able to elevate or rise, you know, and uh, things like that. And so you got to have fun with it. And that's what we're, we're yeah. doing at the end of the day. Even if you're just swinging it. Right. <laughs> I'm looking at the, actually, I'm looking at the logo right now. It's pretty cool. The, the beak and the F are part of, you've incorporated the, the beak into the letter F of Falcon. Very cool. That's a good one. I'm going to, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, uh, Ashton and Ryan, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. Absolutely. Well, thank you for having us. Our pleasure. We appreciate the opportunity to be on Technology and Friends.